it is now time to start our international speech contest. Friendly <laughs> reminder, if you use your cell phone or any other noisemaker during the break, please ensure that it is on silent, alarm, or better yet, just turn it off. Once the contest has begun, the sergeant at arms will secure both the doors. Members of the audience are asked to refrain from leaving or entering the room during the contest. After the contest, please do not leave the room until it is determined that all of the ballots have been collected. Please check to see if any devices, such as a cell phone or pager, need to be turned off or silenced since the intermission. I will now announce the speaking order. International speech contestants will go in this order. Contestant number one, Jim Herbert. Contestant number two, Bill Gattis. Contestant number three, Heather Vaughn. Contestant number four, Jennifer Foss. And contestant Contestant number five, John Benishek. We will now proceed with the international speech contest. There will be one minute of silence between each contestant. Timekeepers, when I advise you to do so, please signal <coughs> me with the green light when one minute is up. After all contestants have spoken, the judges will be given all the time they need to complete their ballot. International speech contestant number one, Jim Herbert, with the speech title, Magical Serendipity <coughs> on the Red Line. <laughs> interesting ever happens in my everyday routine. Fellow Toastmasters, friends, Madam Toastmaster, Mr. Contest Chair, I don't believe any of that garbage and neither should you. I believe in gratitude. I believe in joy. I believe in magic. And I believe in magical serendipities. And I believe every single one of us can find our own magical serendipity every single day just take off our blinders and we're willing to open our eyes. I ask you, Toastmasters and friends, are you willing to open your eyes? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I remember one of my magical serendipities recently. It was last November, and it was an unusually cold and windy November morning. And there was a perfect storm of chaos to ruin our morning commute. Three accidents on Lakeshore Drive. A bus fire near a brown line stop that shut down both the bus line and the brown line. Anybody here happen to remember that November morning? Well, I sure do, because I had to get to work from the north side to the loop that day, and it wasn't happening. Clearly, Lakeshore Drive wasn't happening. Clark Street wasn't happening. Sheridan Road, not a chance. So I had to go to a plan B, which I'm not really good with, and I had my wife drop me off at the Wilson Avenue red line stop. And you see, I'm embarrassed to say, after 25 years in Chicago, I know nothing about the CTA. I don't even own a venture card. But I bought one that morning. And when I got up on that cold train platform, I was not in a good place. So I figured I'd get out my iPod and try to find something to chill out my vibration. Start looking through. Lady Gaga? No. Guns N' Roses? Not a chance. Deepak Chopra peace meditations. Yes, 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 yes. So I'm just about to put my earbuds in, summarily tuning out the world for the next 30 minutes. And right before that happens, this little guy, all of five foot nothing, wearing a Carhartt jacket, work boots, and a knit cap, he walks up to me and he says a thing that doesn't just change my morning, it quite frankly changed my life. You want to know what he said? Yeah. He said, nice boots. He said, nice boots. I sure wish I had some boots like that, because they look warm, and I work out in the cold sometimes. So instead of putting my earbuds in when the train pulled up and tuning out to a different chill vibration, I got on the train with this little guy, 
and I listened to what he had to say. And this is what I learned. I learned his name was Jamal. And I learned he had six kids ranging from four to 19. And I learned it was payday, and he was going to buy some new clothes for his four-year-old daughter. And I learned tomorrow he was going to NIU to visit his oldest son, Robert, who was the first person in his family who ever gone to college. And I learned Jamal was so proud. And I learned that Jamal commuted an hour and a half in both directions every day so he could get to his job as a helper on a delivery truck for Southern Wine and Spirits. And I learned that Jamal was grateful. He was grateful that his parents, who both had cancer last year, were in remission now. And I learned that Jamal had faith. And he attributed his faith to his religious upbringing. But I also learned that he didn't think it mattered what you believed in, as long as you believed in something, most notably, yourself. Remember at the beginning how I said, don't believe anything, nothing interesting happens in your everyday routine? This is why I say, don't believe that, friends and Toastmasters. Well, then I got to work. And I work in a very public place. It's a high-end steak and seafood restaurant downtown. And I run the door, so every day I get to encounter hundreds of people. And on that particular day, the only thing people wanted to talk about was how terrible their commute was, how much they hated the weather, how much they felt the universe summarily ruined their individual day. And I waited all day long to hear the one thing I really wanted to hear. You want to know what I wanted to hear? I wanted to hear someone say, Gosh, I sure hope everybody that was on that bus that caught on fire is going to be okay. But I didn't hear it. Not even once. So here I was, faced with this dichotomy. Over here I have these fortunate people eating steak and stone crab and lobster for lunch. And they're miserable. And they don't seem to get it. And then over here, I've got this little guy, all the five foot nothing with six kids, two parents who have cancer, commutes three hours a day to get back and forth to a job that pays them a little bit more than our ridiculously low minimum wage. And what is he? He is grateful and he is happy. At the end of my train ride with Jamal that day, I wanted to say something to him. I wanted to tell him how much he touched my heart. But before I could say anything to him, he held his hand out to me, and he said, Thank you very much for talking to me today, sir. I'm sure grateful for your time, and I learned a lot by listening to you. Whoa, ho, ho. it clearly was I that was the student that died, Mr. Jamal, not you. Thank you for your teaching. Fellow Toastmasters and friends, so I ask you this. The next time you're stuck in traffic, losing your mind, the next time you're waiting on that train platform for the train that never seems to want to come. The next time you can't get your bus because maybe it's actually on fire. <laughs> Don't think so much about where you're going. Don't think so much about how you're going to get there. Don't think so much about when you're going to get there. And maybe tilt with your eyes, take a look around. And maybe see if you can find your own magical serendipity. Because I guarantee you it's out there if you're willing to open your eyes. Toastmasters and friends, I ask you this. Are you willing to open your eyes? Yes. Thank you. Madam Toastmasters.
killing creativity. Stop killing creativity. Bill Gatos. You are all killing creativity. I'm Toastmaster, fellow members and guests. Stop it. Stop killing creativity. Some of you have just rolled your eyes, perhaps even looked at me a little funny. How many of you out there have thought, mm, I don't kill creativity? Show of hands. Thank you for being honest. Congratulations, because you've just proven my point. <laughs> Before I've even had a chance to talk to you about my idea and present it, you completely dismissed it. We do this all the time. When we step into our business meetings and we're trying to problem solve and ideate, and somebody says, that's not going to work. It's too expensive. You're crazy. <laughs> we do this with our family and our friends as well. I did this just the other, the other day with my daughter. She was playing her guitar and pounding out random chords, making up a song. Could you please just follow the sheet music <laughs> that your teacher laid out for you? Or when she dumps all 24 of her crayons on the table to finish her art project, could we just use five or six? Dinner's in 10 minutes. Let's bring this up. How do you think people feel when we do these things, whether verbal or nonverbal, do you feel empowered? No. Do you want to contribute? There's a fear of failure that you don't want to do anything. But keep this in mind, folks. Keep this in mind. Ideas build upon ideas. Solutions built upon solutions. So that first idea may not have been the best, but it could bring in something else. It could bring in something new. Does everybody see what I have in my hand? <coughs> anybody know what it is? Silly Putty. A quick story about Silly Putty. Silly Putty was invented by a scientist at GE at the onset of World War II. He was tasked with creating synthetic rubber because the Japanese had invaded Singapore and cut off all supply of natural rubber in the United States. This was his first attempt. <laughs> Would you want this as a tire? <laughs> I would. But he persevered. And he came up with synthetic rubber. But that's not the end of the story. You see, the executives at GE started carrying this around in their dinner parties. <coughs> Drink in one hand, this in the other. And one day, a toy maker happened to visit one of these dinner parties. And she said, what is this stuff? And, and he said, well, it's, it's a failed experiment. It didn't work. She said, I'll buy this off of you. You want to buy this? Yeah, I, I want to buy this because I'm going to sell it as a toy and kids will love it. They'll play with it. Are you crazy? No one would ever want to play with this. And she said, oh yeah, well all of you are playing with it. <laughs> Seventy years later, we're still playing with it. In fact, I'm actually going to stop playing with it for a few minutes here. At this time, you're thinking, hmm, Bill, I get it. We're killing creativity, but that doesn't account for inventions. That doesn't account for new ideas. I mean, people are still doing that stuff. <laughs> like Einstein and Edison, right? They're, they're still they, they, they created things that were great. Well, sure, yes, but, and I agree with that statement. However, in fact, when they were growing up, when they were in school, they were continuously told that they were not smart, that they would never amount to anything. 
And yet they still went on to create inventions, and develop theories. Now just imagine, if you will, what they could have accomplished had they been in a more positive, reinforcing, supportive environment. How many more inventions we would have? How many more great theories would have been invented? I want everyone here to participate in an experiment with me, very briefly. I want everyone to just close their eyes for a moment and imagine a world with no limitations, no failure, risk of failure, no risk. You can do anything you want, you can accomplish anything you want. Open your eyes. The first time I did this, I felt so empowered. The positivity just flowing within me. I felt that I could do anything. I felt like I could be Superman, jumping off of buildings, flying around. It's that same aura of positivity and reinforcement that we <coughs> should be projecting to others and giving to others. In fact, Einstein once said, imagination is everything. It is a preview of life's coming attractions. Imagination, a preview of life's coming attractions. So what I want everyone here to do today, when they leave, is to stop killing creativity and enable creativity. Do it. International speech <laughs> contestant number three, Heather Vaughn, the purple eyebrow lady. The purple eyebrow lady, Heather Vaughn. I figured I'd give it a try. 
Besides, I had what looked like two deranged caterpillars on my forehead. <laughs> so I had nothing to lose. I registered at the salon's front desk. Five long minutes passed and happy customer number one appeared. She is the best ever! My excitement started to grow. Ten excruciating minutes passed and happy customer number two came around the corner. She is worth the wait. Yes, I declared this woman my brown master before she ever touched a hair on my forehead. Soon, the lady working her magic came to see who was next. Heather, she said. I jumped up to greet her, but our eyes never met. There had to have been a mistake. Not only are her brows tattooed on, they were tattooed in the color purple. It was too late to run or hide, so I followed her back to her chair, all the while thinking, don't judge a book by its cover. Don't judge a book by its cover. How do you want them to look, she asked. In order to leave no room for confusion, I responded, thick. <laughs> hair? <laughs> With a grin on her face, she quickly whipped the chair back and got to work. This woman was like Edward Scissorhands. Hair was flying everywhere. <laughs> Next thing I knew, she had finished with one side. She handed me a mirror so that I could inspect her work. But my thoughts were racing. Since I probably don't have any hair left, how long is it going to take for my brows to grow back? And how much do one of those eyebrow pencil things even cost? <coughs> and, and, it was perfect. In my relief, she quickly went to work on the other brow, and before you knew it, I was finished and out the door. Happy customer, number three. Over the next visit, I learned that her name is Tammy. As the weeks passed, Tammy shared with me her story of how she lost not only her brows, but also her lashes to an autoimmune disease. Two years later, and Tammy is the only one I can trust to tame my Groucho Marx forehead. <laughs> Though this experience was superficial, it went on to expose my biases Prejudices. What are some of yours? My first impressions of Tammy were the classic battle of reality versus point of view. The reality was I had two customers confirm that Tammy was more than capable of doing her job. Instead, I held this false point of view of what skill should look like. Perfect and familiar. How often in your life do you wait for the answers to your problems, be them big or small, to come in a neat package? The perfect box filled to the brim with familiar answers and tied neatly with a perfect bow. As an imperfect person living in an unpredictable world, those expectations were going to continue to hold me back and close me off to new possibilities. This discount store's purple eyebrow genius went on to show me that the answers I seek can and will come from the most unexpected of places and people. So I ask you, who may be the purple eyebrow people in your life? I encourage you, when at work, build a bridge to that person that you think you may not like. If you are a teacher of any kind, bond with the students that are either disruptive or disconnected. Take the time to turn back the covers of those you meet and get to know them, page after page. Soon you will expand your web of connections that may include that student who will inspire you with their hopes, or that coworker who may challenge you with their beliefs. You may even find your own Tammy who will impress you with their abilities. Cool. To where you won't want to judge a book by its cover. 
ever again. Madam Toastmaster. International speech contestant number four, Jennifer Fox. If you give them an inch, if you give them an inch, Jennifer Fox. Imagine you are a teacher. Your students are 10 years old in the fourth grade. You enter the classroom and realize that something is amiss. There are overturned desks. There are footprints everywhere. And there are the faces of your students staring back at you. And the answer is scrawled on the chalkboard in giant letters. Four of your students are missing. Mr. Contest Chair, Toastmasters and guests, what would you do? But before you can even answer that question, your principal walks in. I can tell you from experience, this is not a good thing. <laughs> Four of my students really did disappear mysteriously. As I take you down the path to find them and find out what happened, consider, what is the difference between losing control and releasing it. On our hunt for clues about what happened to my students, let me take you back to one of the pre-service education classes I had taken in college. The professor, Mrs. Johns, was a Tasmanian devil. She looked out at our young, happy pre-teacher faces, and she pounced. If you give them an inch, they will take a mile. You have to lay down the law, show them who's boss. Don't even think of smiling until Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> so thinking about this class, had I lost control? Had I given them the proverbial inch? My first years in teaching were a study in fear. What do you do when you're afraid of losing control? For me, the answer was to hold on as tight as possible. I set up my classroom just as Mrs. Johns had described in her lecture. I taught my students how to stand in line, how to walk down the hall, and how to turn their homework in on time. <laughs> I kept that inch all to myself, and it felt good. Until the day we had a visit from a foreign correspondent who came to share the stories of his explorations. I prepared my students to welcome him warmly, and they asked their scripted questions. <laughs> but then, he asked them a question. What do you think? What do you think about your school? What do you think about your city? What do you think about your country? What do you think about the world? My fourth grader's eyes widened, and every head in the room turned for me. I hadn't told them what to think. <laughs> but even worse, I hadn't taught them how to think. 
This journalist asked my students to step outside of the one inch radius I had given them, and they were lost. At that moment, I realized my classroom had been rooted in fear rather than soaring toward inspiration. What do you do when your attempts at control have gone too far? Me? I started over. That summer, I tore up the notes from Mrs. Johns' class, and I asked myself some questions. How can I get my students to think? If I give them that inch, what will happen? And if they take that mile, where will they end up? That fall, I released control and handed over the learning to my students. I created a real-life mystery that turned my students into detectives in the case of the missing grade book. They became scientists to analyze unknown substances, and they became legislators in a class congress. From that point forward, anything anyone wanted to do in our classroom had to be written into a bill and passed into the law by the class house and senate. <laughs> my students debated the merits of different recess games. They created procedures for saying the Pledge of Allegiance. They even passed a law to implement a school-wide science fair. I gave them that inch, and they took a mile, and then they kept going. After a year of encouraging my students to explore the world for themselves, I should not have been surprised when they took matters into their own hands. They created a mystery for me to solve, cleverly titled, The Mysterious Kidnapping of Four Students. <laughs> Granted, the kidnapping felt as if a giant puppy had placed a dead squirrel at my feet. <laughs> I wasn't quite sure what to do with the squirrel, but I knew their efforts took creativity and initiative and thinking. I could not have been prouder. That year, my students taught me. I learned that it's really hard to grow when you're confined to a small space. Is there someone in your life to whom you might give that inch? A friend, a family member, an employee, or perhaps yourself? You see, I also discovered that before I could give my students that inch, I had to release control and step outside of my one inch radius. The moment I began to explore my mile is the moment I began to grow as a teacher. Where might your mile take you? That afternoon in my classroom, my principal surveyed the scene. She looked at me with a question in her eyes. Don't ask, please, don't ask. She nodded, turned, and left me to solve the mystery that my students created. She gave me that inch, the inch I needed to help my students soar. Madam Toastmaster?
am not afraid of failure. You don't frighten me. You can fight me day and night throughout eternity. I am not afraid of failure. I am no frightened pup. Come on, failure. Bring it on! For I do not give up. Madam Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters, and honored guests. Failure is a bully on the playground who steals more than just your lunch money. He steals your desire to try anything outside of your comfort zone. Have any of you ever been afraid of failure? I know I sure have. When I was eight years old, I would wake up every morning in a cold sweat, dreading my trip to school, for I knew that failure was waiting for me in the classroom. You see, back then, I suffered from attention deficit disorder. And in fact, I still struggle with it every day of my life. But back in 1960, there was no such thing as ADD. There were only good kids and bad kids. And I was a very bad kid. I could not pay attention in class. I spent my whole life back then suffering and receiving punishments, as if suffering from ADD was not punishment enough. I remember, like it was yesterday, hearing my teachers say, Class, you are now going to work on penmanship, because penmanship is going to be a very important skill to have in the 21st century. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you think that's funny? You are staying after class. Now, on the board are ten sentences, and you are going to copy each one ten times. I thought, I can do that. How hard can it be? The quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. The quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. The quick brown fox jumps over the lazy... Did you ever notice that a pencil is shaped just like a rocket? <laughs> when I grow up, I am going to be an astronaut. And I'll be the first man on the moon. When I come back to Earth, they'll have a huge parade for me. And I'll have dinner with the president. And everyone will love me and respect me. And, uh-oh, it's time to hand in the assignment. And I have 97 left to copy. <laughs> well, maybe she won't notice. Oh, she's deliberately searching for my paper. She found it. She's holding it up. She's saying, class, look at this. This is Johnny's paper. Oh my, he actually completed three whole sentences. Do you know what this is? This is the work of a loser. This is the work of someone who will be a failure for the rest of his life. I don't know where that woman learned to teach. <laughs> but one thing I do know is that public humiliation did not help fix my problem. It only made it worse. I crawled into my shell never wanting to ever come out because the shame of failure made me give up. But then one day, Someone gave me a Coke to drink at lunchtime, and I discovered that caffeine allowed me to stay on task and gave me the ability to complete incredibly boring assignments and turn them in on time. <laughs> Thanks to caffeine, I was able to graduate from college with high honors, get a job, and stay employed. <coughs> what this taught me is that there is no shame in failure. The only shame is in giving up. You see, failure is a tool. Every failure helps you identify 
weaknesses that you need to work on in order to improve yourself. And after you correct them, you become more powerful. The world is full of famous people who failed on their way to success. Michael Jordan failed to make half the shots he took. Babe Ruth failed to get a hit two out of every three times at the plate. Thomas Edison was asked why he continued to try to invent a light bulb after failing 700 times. Edison replied by saying, I have not failed 700 times. I have not failed even once. I have successfully proven that 700 ways do not work. <laughs> after I eliminate the ways that do not work, I will find a way that does. So you see, if you want to increase your successes, then you need to increase your failures. Success is overrated. <laughs> Anyone can be successful in easy things. But how many of us can dare to fail spectacularly? <coughs> By that I mean fail to cure cancer, fail to bring about world peace, fail to make this planet a better place for the next hundred generations. Oh, I know that goals such as these are not easy to achieve, but the more difficult the struggle, the more glorious the triumph. So break out of failure prison, remove the leash of failure that's holding you back, and instead use failure as a tool to make yourself more powerful than you can possibly imagine, so that you can step up to the high stage, climb the tallest mountain, and shout to the world that I am not afraid of failure. You don't frighten me. You can fight me day and night throughout eternity. I am not afraid of failure. You cannot thwart my happiness. For I have found that failure is the secret to success. Madam Toastmaster.
Madam Countess Housemaster, we have all of the best.
and it's a healing, <coughs> spiritual, amazing experience. And I invite all of you to try, just go to NIA, N-I-A, now, and look up a video and see what it is. It's, I mean, you have movements like this, you have movements like this, you have your all kinds of stuff, <laughs> and you demonstrate with my friend Priscilla, we, that in the NIA class, you make, you make friends there, it's fun, it opens your mind, it's really something amazing. That's what NIA is. <laughs> Thank you for that invitation. And here is your certificate for participation. Thank you so much. And for our last table talk is contestant. What's your name again? I think it's no joke. So we have Heather Vaughn. And how long have you been in? For two years. Okay. And which club are you representing? All states speak easy. Yeah. Yeah. Your Toastmasters education. CC at what today? I have my ACB. Yeah.
to whenever that is, to reference what you were talking about, when the power of love wins out over the love of power, this world will be a perfect place to live. <laughs> yeah. Great. Okay, well, thank you for
uh, do the Beatles or Michael Jackson or somebody. But I enjoyed it. Unfortunately, you know, I, you know that my child was rather difficult, my childhood. Well, unfortunately, I have been paid back because my youngest son is very similar to the way I was. And he's a musician also, too, and we're having a lot of fun. <laughs> Topics uh, contest. Uh, we can do with third place through first. Third first. Third, yes. Third first. <laughs> no, that's confusing. <laughs> <laughs> We're Toastmasters. We're able to figure anything. <clears throat> In third place in the Northeast Division table topics is Shino Lilly. Topics is Joanne Telser Farr. And our first place winner, who will be, will be going 
moving on to the, I know you'll all be at the convention, so of course you'll all see this contest. And our first place winner for the Northeast Division Table Topics Contest is Heather Vaughn. Contest, and of course, we know the winner is coming out of our division. We all know that. <laughs> and that person will have a free paid trip to Las Vegas this year to uh, join the trio and uh, show off our stuff and very possibly be the international winner. Third place for the Northeast Division International Contest is Jim Herbert.